Welcome to the uh, first lecture that you're going to have over the summer, which is a discussion on what science is and what the nature of science is and how can we use science as a tool because in reality our entire civilization has really been based upon um, these findings that science has made over the past say three centuries. So in order to do that we have to understand a little bit about the process. Now you probably learned this stuff before but we're going to have a little bit of a different outlook on it. So the goal of science is to investigate and understand nature, to explain events in nature, and to use those explanations to make hypotheses. Now, we're going to talk about hypotheses a lot. It's not exactly what you have, um, if you what you may remember them as being. And we're going to focus more on a, a full, complete scientific thought, especially when you're writing. So uh, we then investigate by making observations, and then we collect data after we make those observations and we use that data to draw conclusions. All right, so a hypothesis. You probably heard of it as an if-then statement. It is not a prediction. That's the problem. A lot of times teachers teach it as like, if I do this, then this will happen because. But that because actually includes a prediction which is not part of the hypothesis. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you write a proper hypothesis today. So the old way, it would be if I do this, then this will happen. If I study my vocab words, I will do well on the quiz. If I add this type of fertilizer, the plant will grow more. Okay. The better way to write it would be that variable A affects variable B. Very, um, very infrequently will you see um, an if-then statement in a scientific journal. They just don't write them that way. So. Studying a quiz will affect my achievement on, or studying will affect my achievement on a vocab quiz. Okay, there's no prediction in there. You're just saying this affects that. And that's going to be how you write your hypotheses, but there's going to be other components that you're going to have to include in there as well. Because the AP thinks that the if then statement is actually still okay. I'm trying to get you away from that though, because when you go into college, it's not going to be considered really appropriate. So, as I said, a hypothesis does not include predictions. But we always follow a hypothesis with a prediction and usually some experimental design component in it as well. So let me give you an example as it's stated here. Plants need sources of nitrogen and phosphorus to thrive. It is hypothesized that adding a nitrogen and phosphorus based fertilizer will affect plant growth. When fertilizer is added, one would expect an increase in overall biomass of those plants compared to a control group that received sham fertilizer. That is a complete scientific thought. It includes a hypothesis, prediction, and enough background information to get your point across and why you're actually testing what you want to test. So in here, I've actually highlighted um, the hypothesis and the prediction. The hypothesis is in red. Um, adding a nitrogen and phosphorus-based fertilizer will affect plant growth. And then my prediction follows. Increase overall biomass uh, of those compared to a control group that received, received a sham fertilizer. So you really need to have all of that included in order to be a proper scientific thought, as I said. Okay, so you're going to get practice with those as we go through the entire year. Um, another characteristic of hypotheses is they must be testable and they must be falsifiable. So something that's testable means you have to be able to actually design an experiment to test that idea. Um, one thing about science is that science does not deal with supernatural things at all. Okay, So even though science and religion are not... Um, incompatible in terms of you know you can be religious and be a scientist or vice versa when you are testing things you have to be as discriminatory as possible and as objective as possible uh, and like if you believe that something supernatural happened a lot of times that supernatural thing is out of the realm of the natural world meaning it's not testable so we only deal with things that are testable and we don't talk about supernatural things usually in the class as well because of that. Uh, so for example, uh, it must be testable. Uh, if you say, I don't know, there are fairies flying around my head right now. And then I come back at you and I'm like, no, there isn't. But then you say, well, there is. They're just invisible. It's like, okay, at some point, I must be able to test this thing and I must be able to falsify it. If you just keep giving me excuses, it's not going to be falsifiable. That's the other idea. So can, uh, can the hypothesis be shown not to be supported if we collected data on it? So usually there is some data we could collect that could show it to be that hypothesis to not work. 
So we use hypothesis problem solving and scientific problem solving in everyday problems, which is why is it so why it's so important to be able to do. Uh, here's showing you an example of it with batteries. If you want, you can pause it. I'm not going to really talk about it, but it makes sense, right? So batteries are dead, and you can test different predictions of what's actually causing. Are the or the flashlight is dead? Is it the batteries or is the light? Is it the light bulb? And you can do some tests to figure that out. So hypotheses help to define what we're looking at. Uh, it guides us to be focused in our experiment, and it helps to also think ahead of what we're expecting to get. That's why it's kind of like an educated guess or statement about what we think is going to happen. There's this other concept called the null hypothesis, which we're going to be dealing with a lot. And the null hypothesis, and you want to make sure you know this, means that there is no effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. So if you remember, if you do a hypothesis, if I do this, the I do this is the independent variable, the then this will happen is the dependent variable. If I add fertilizer, the fertilizer is the independent variable, then this will happen is the dependent variable, Okay, which is, in this case, plant growth. We would expect the fertilizer to affect the plant growth. Uh, as it says down here. The null hypothesis, though, would be that there is no effect at all on fertilizer, of fertilizer on plant growth, compared to a control. The null hypothesis is not an opposite. Like you, a null hypothesis means there's absolutely no effect of this fertilizer. We could have the alternate hypothesis to what we expected, which was we kind of expected it to increase. That was our prediction, plant growth. What if it decreased plant growth? That would be called the alternative hypothesis, not the null. So the null is no effect. You have your hypothesis, and the alternate hypothesis would be like the opposite of what you predict. Okay. I don't actually use this because I think it's just easy to understand, but sometimes people use this purple rain has everyone acting crazy uh, mnemonic to figure this, to, to memorize it. But you don't have to ever memorize it, so it doesn't matter. You just have to know how to think properly. That's going to be my focus this year is to teach you how to think. So the scientific method is state the problem. So you basically... You know, through your research, you figure out, oh, there's this issue that no one really knows the answer to. You then research that problem to make yourself not make yourself super educated on it, or as educated as you possibly can. You then formulate your hypothesis. You conduct and you create and conduct an experiment. You analyze the data, and you figure out and draw conclusions based on that. And then you retest it over and over again to make sure your data is consistent. And as a result, then at the end of it. You then write a paper, and that paper is sent out to lots of different scientists to read. And we'll talk about, that's called peer review. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or now. So, it's so, it, this is one of the most important things about science, and a lot of people don't realize this when they, you know, when they learn about it, that scientists, scientific journals and papers go through a process called peer review. And what you do in that is, after you conduct your experiment, and you draw your conclusions and you write your paper, you send that paper out to four or more experts in your field. Those experts tear your paper apart and they, they point out any inaccuracies or any other issues that there may be with your uh, paper. And sometimes they actually completely reject it all outright. Sometimes they reject it and you have to rewrite it a little bit. Other times you have to rewrite it a lot. And then you send it back to them again, and then they give it the okay. So science is always scrutinized a lot, and eventually, because it's kind of a self-correcting process, because other people use your information to further science, if you do incorrect science that is bad, whether on purpose or not, it will be found out eventually. So new experiments will come from your findings, and as I said, if you make a mistake, people will be able to find that mistake and hopefully fix it if you did make a mistake, whether purposeful or not purposeful. Uh, it's self-correcting. All right, now to variables. There's two different main variables that you have in a scientific experiment, and those are the only two you really should have. You try to control all the other ones that can affect it. One is the experimental group, and the other is the control group. The experimental group receives your independent variable, whatever that may be. The control group is the one that is not being tested, but that's what we compare to. So that's like our baseline that we want to check. Sometimes that's called a placebo, a group that gets a placebo or something like that. And we'll talk about that. I'm actually going to have you guys watch a video on that as well as part of your summer assignment. All right. So the independent variable is the variable that's usually on the x-axis of a graph always. And that's what I change as the experimenter. If I do this, so in this case, as we said uh, with the fertilizer example, 
adding fertilizer. That's your independent variable. The dependent variable is the outcome. How did the independent variable affect the dependent variable? What are it affected the growth of the plant in this case? Sometimes I remember it as dependent or data collected. There's another concept called controlled variables, which are different from your control group. Okay, uh, Because we only want to test one independent variable at a time in tests, uh, we want to make sure that everything else is under control that could have some effect on the results, or we have to take them to account in some way. So if you think about that um, fertilizer example, you want to keep the temperature the same, the amount of sunlight the same, the amount of water the same, uh, maybe the amount of the type of plant. All that kind of stuff needs to be controlled. And you want to be able to always remember that when you're trying to design proper experiments. So here's some examples of we're testing. Fertilizer, as I said, water, sunlight, temperature, type of soil, the pH of the soil. All of those things can have an effect. All right. So how do you always improve an experiment? I have two highlighted in orange because this answer is always correct if you say that. Repeat the experiment over and over again. And we'll talk about why that's important when we get into biostats. But also you can increase your sample size. In both cases, it makes your data more valid. It's less of a chance to be a fluke or a random chance affected that data specifically. So the first thing, reduce experimental bias. That's when you can say, like, what are some issues that you personally did or the experimenter did to have biased either purposely or not purposely um, the experiment? And then lastly, I have no idea what that says one all the way down, but uh, you want to control other variables. So talk about other variables you control that maybe weren't controlled for that could have had an effect on the experiment. All right. Super important. You need to know what a theory is in science. It's a common misconception that people think that theories are the same thing that people use um, in general um, conversation when they say theories. But in science, a theory, first off, has explanatory power. So it explains lots of different phenomena, and it actually explains how they happen. It's not actually like it's not like a law. Sometimes you're taught that a hypothesis can become a theory, can become a law if enough data supports it. No, that's not true. The theory is a separate thing altogether. Usually, it's a, a very ge general hypothesis that explains lots of different things, um, and it can never become a law. So an example would be the theory of evolution by natural selection. That explains how things evolved. Things do evolve. Uh, we're going to talk about that when we get into evolution. There's evidence of it. We have direct evidence. We have lots of um, fossil evidence and things that have shown that things have evolved over the course of millions and millions of years. Um, the theory of evolution explains how that happened by natural selection. Okay? The cell theory explains that everything is made up of cells. And all of our, a lot of our emergent properties, which we'll talk about, are a result of that as well. The Big Bang Theory. All of our evidence that we have so far points that that is actually what happened. And because of that, that helps to explain a lot of phenomenon that we have seen. So it has been tested over and over again, never shown to be incorrect. That's an important point. And it explains a wide variety of phenomena. Those are the two components of a theory. Okay. As I said, it must be broad in scope. It's supported by a large body of evidence. It helps to generate new hypotheses, but also it explains how things happen. A good example would be gravity. There's a law of gravity. Gravity happens. It's a thing. It exists. Um, and then there is Einstein's theory of relativity, which explains how, kind of how gravity works. So that's a theory because it explains how it happens. And the law is that it does happen. All right. A lot of people say that the scientific me method is a myth. It's an idealized process. But in reality, scientists do use all these steps that we've been talking about to actually come up with a final um, a final to draw a final conclusion. It's not always in the same order. It's not perfect, but we all we use that type of thinking in order to think through problems. All right, that's it for the first uh, lecture you have. I hope it wasn't too painful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me.